The American West is full of outlaw stories. Several of these infamous men, and in some cases women, worked alone. Others were leaders of outlaw gangs. Some of these gangs are well known today, while others are hardly remembered. One such individual and his gang was L. H. Lewis Musgrove. Musgrove ran a highly organized criminal outfit. The gang ranged from Montana in the north to Texas and New Mexico in the south and as far east as western Kansas and Nebraska. Musgrove was born in Illinois in 1832. Soon, however, the family moved to Tennessee. Eight years later, they moved to northern Mississippi. In 1850, Musgrove went to California and seemed to be doing well. While in California, he married and had three children. His wife, however, died in 1862. It was at this time that Musgrove started his life of homicide. It began as a result of the conflict between the North and the South. Musgrove shot a man over his Unionist views. As a result, he was run out of town and went to Nevada. He was forced to leave that territory after killing two men, again because of their anti-Southern views. By 1863, Musgrove was an Indian trader at Fort Halleck in southern Wyoming. It was here he shot and killed another man who called him a liar. Musgrove this time, however, was arrested and sent to Denver for trial. However, he was released on a legal technicality. He returned to the Overland Trail area in 1864 and became the leader of an outlaw gang. The gang specialized in stolen livestock, but also robbed the occasional stagecoach and train. They frequently disguised themselves as Indians, to the point of scalping some of their victims to avoid detection. Horse stealing, however, was the gang's main criminal enterprise. They would steal horses in one state or territory, drive them to another location where the animals were sold. With headquarters in the Denver area and a group of informants, Musgrove skillfully moved the stolen stock from one location to another. Years later, the Leadville Daily Herald wrote, The Musgrove gang was possibly the largest and most desperate lot of men there ever joined together in the West for unlawful purposes. I believe money and I feel it in my pocket. Look, why don't we dump this herd on a fast market and clear out? You know you don't get top prices for horses that way. Yeah, but if you see for stretching our luck, forget it. Meet me in Denver in five days. With headquarters in Denver area and a group of informants, Musgrove skillfully moved the stolen stock from one location to another. By that time, I'll have one of the finest pieces of grazing land in Colorado. Well, Musgrove, you've pulled it before, so maybe you can do it again. But someday you're going to forget someday. In late 1868, Musgrove's crime empire was coming apart. There are two stories about Musgrove's capture, but they all agree on his end. Story number one contends that on October 28, 1868, a John Corrin captured Musgrove near Elk Mountain and delivered him to the soldiers at Fort Steele, Wyoming. A few days after his arrest, members of the Musgrove gang wrecked a Union Pacific train near the fort in an attempt to enable Musgrove's escape. The escape attempt failed. Musgrove, placed on another train, shackled, handcuffed, and guarded by 40 soldiers, was transferred to Denver.
Story number two involves United States Marshal David Clark. Clark arrived in Denver with the purpose to clean up the city and the area of criminal elements. Cook worked with other law enforcement officers in collecting and sharing information. From the facts he was able to obtain, Clark determined that the Denver area was headquarters of the horse-stealing ring. Clark built up a network of informants in the Denver crime world. All his work led to one suspect, Lee Musgrove. Finding Musgrove proved difficult. Fortunately, Clark had a breakthrough when several gang members were captured on a raid in West Kansas. Musgrove went into hiding and effective communication between gang members broke down and several more were arrested. With the law hot on his trail, many of Musgrove's contacts and support turned against him. Eventually, Musgrove was captured. Stories of the capture vary, but Musgrove was turned over to Marshall Clark in Denver. Clark locked Musgrove in the Larimer Street Jail to await trial. A trial, however, did not come. Musgrove bragged that his gang would break him out of jail before he went to trial. To prove that point, a couple of gang members were spotted in Denver. Realizing they had been recognized, the two gang members, Ed Franklin and Sanford Dugan, fled Denver. Marshall Clark received word that Franklin and Dugan were in Golden, Colorado, and went there to arrest them. Dugan was found in a saloon, and a gunfight resulted. Dugan, however, managed to escape. Franklin was found in a hotel room, and another gunfight occurred, resulting in Franklin being killed. While Clark was away in Gordon, the people of Denver became concerned about Musgrove. His infamy as an outlaw and boast of his escaping were too much for the good citizens of Denver. A large, disciplined, and armed crowd gathered outside the jail to debate Musgrove's fate. The group, which included several prominent citizens, determined Musgrove should hang. The jail guards allowed the men to seize Musgrove. He was then taken to the nearby Larimer Street Bridge over Cherry Creek. Musgrove asked to be allowed to write his family. This request was granted, and Musgrove wrote two letters, one to his brother in Mississippi and another to his second wife in Denver. In both letters, he claimed his innocence of any crime and did not know why he was being hanged. After writing the letters, he was placed in the wagon with a noose around his neck. As the wagon pulled away, Musgrove jumped into the air and off the wagon bed. By this act, he ensured himself a quick death. Marshal Clark had received information that Dugan was in Cheyenne. He went to Cheyenne and arrested Dugan without incident. Clark knew there was a likelihood of Dugan also being lynched by the Denver citizens. To prevent this, the arrival time of the stagecoach was changed. It nearly worked, but the approaching coach garnered too much attention from onlookers. Soon, the stage was racing down the street, avoiding the pursuing mob. The coach arrived at the jail, and Dugan was hurried inside, but the prisoner was not out of harm's way. Information had been leaked that Dugan was to be transferred to another jail. On the day of the transfer, the wagon transporting Dugan was ambushed by a group of 90 armed men. Dugan was removed and taken to a nearby field with several large cottonwood trees.
The transportation wagon was moved under one of the trees. A rope was thrown over the limb. In an instant, Dugan found himself standing on a wagon with a noose around his neck. Asked for any final remarks, Dugan requested a Catholic priest. He denied one of the killings while claiming self-defense in the other. He begged for his life and prayed for mercy. His pleas persuaded no one, and the order was given to drive on. His body dropped 18 inches from the wagon, breaking his neck. Dugan's body was cut down the following day and turned over to the coroner. The message to outlaws by the people of Denver had been sent. Thank you for watching this video. If you like this, please like, comment, and subscribe. Thank you.